Morning. 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 My name's Clive Jones, and I'm a research scientist here at the Perry Institute. I understand you've got a bunch of interesting questions to ask me, so why don't we get started? Did you go to any science camps when you were little? I didn't. I didn't go to a science camp. I did go to an archaeology camp, though. It was in England, where I was born, and this was digging up a, a Bronze Age, or how many year, thousands of years ago is that? Quite a long time ago. A few thousand years ago, it was a burial mound, you know, where people were buried, and we did, it was an archaeological expedition, and uh, I was part of that, and uh, I learned how to dig up things and clean them and catalog stuff that you found and mm -hmm. so on. And then after that, I also went on uh, summer volunteer camps for the National Trust, which is a, a, an organization that takes care of the environment in, in Britain. And we had uh, all sorts of things from repairing stone walls to clearing invasive bamboo uh, and things like that. So they, they were, I was a little older then than you guys, but uh, that was great fun every summer. What person made you interested in science? I think it was my elementary school teacher. Um, she was very good at explaining science and had all sorts of, of interesting experiments that you could do. Like uh, the f one I always remember is the uh, creating a vacuum. You know, you take a metal can and you put a little water in it and then you heat it up and then you close the top, and then when it cools down, it collapses. And that, I always remember that experiment. And then she was also very interested in nature, and I got interested in nature there. But my, my parents, while, while they weren't scientists, they were always interested in nature. And so I think that influenced me too. What did you do before you were a scientist? It's funny, really. Nothing. So I went to school, uh, you know, high school, the equivalent of high school, and then I went to university to study science as an undergraduate. And then I uh, went to university to get my doctoral degree in biology and ecology. And then I did a postdoctoral fellowship when I came over from England to the University of Georgia in the south, and I did a postdoc there in entomology, insect stuff, and then I got a job here. So basically, I had fun playing in the sandbox, went to school, started as a scientist. What's the most interesting thing you study? That's a tough one. Okay. I think for me, and it was the, the research that started all the work I do today, it was the rock-eating snails of the Negev Desert. So these are little snails, or, you know, a centimeter or so, just about the size of my, less than the size of my little fingernail there, right? Yeah. And this is a very dry region of the world, it only gets maybe uh, a couple of hundred millimeters, of, a hundred millimeters of rain a year. That's like, how many centimeters? How many inches? Like one inch. Yeah, it's a couple of inches a year. Yeah. And there are all these limestone rocks in the desert, and under the surface of the rock, growing inside, under the surface of the rock, are algae and fungi. Uh, you know what a lichen is? Yeah. Right? It's a symbiosis of an alga and a fungus. Well, these are special kinds of, of um, lichens that live inside rocks. Inside the rock. About a millimeter or two down. And they grow in the spaces in between the rocks. And they're protected from the environment. So they get sunlight. There's enough sunlight comes in. And then in the morning in the desert, there's dew on the rocks because it's been cold.
cold at night, and they use the water to photosynthesize, right? Well, these snails eat those lichens. That's what they live off. They only live on those lichens. And so to eat those lichens, they have to eat the rock, and they scrape the rock with their little, it's like a tongue. It's like a rasp, a file, okay? And they do this, right? And then the teeth break, and it just grows again from the back. So, and it turns out that these guys are making about half of all the soil in the desert by eroding the rocks. And they're transferring all the nitrogen that's stored in the rock from the algae and putting it into the soil for the other plants. So these guys, these tiny little snails that are doing something as weird as eating rocks are basically controlling how that desert works. So I thought that was cool. That was the first time I really started working on nature's engineers. Who has not? Aren't humans like a sort of um, ecosystem engineers too? You bet. We're probably, we're probably the most powerful engineer on the planet and we can change more kinds of environments in more different ways than any other species. So beaver are very good at making dams but they don't do a great job of building burrows. They do some burrowing but they don't dig underground, they don't build cities and roads and airports, move whole mountains. <laughs> so yeah, you're, very, you're right. And that's one of the reasons why, to me, engineering is really interesting, because it allows us to connect what humans do to the environment with what other kinds of organisms do to the environment. How old were you when you became a scientist? Oh, well, officially, when do, when, when, when do you say you become a scientist? When would you know you became a scientist? It was like the first time I became really interested in science, or the first time somebody said, okay, you have a degree, you're now a scientist. Uh, I think maybe like the degree thing. Okay. So I got, I got my bachelor's degree in 1970. Boy, is it tough. I gotta go backwards in time. I don't have a time machine. Um, 1974. Then I got my I got my doctoral degree in 1978, and then I did a postdoc in Georgia for about three years, and then I came here in 1981. Long time ago. Anybody else who hasn't? Okay. What do you learn about Earth? Earth study. Earth. You mean the dirt under my feet? Or you mean the whole planet? Or the, the dirt under my feet. Well, for me, what's really interesting about dirt um, is at least in terms of how organisms mess with it, right? So they can do all sorts of interesting things. They can mix it. They can dig it. They can move it from one place to another. Okay, and how hard it is to dig, or how, uh, so the difference between sand, right, you can dig a hole in sand, and what happens to it? it collapses, yeah. right. And you could, if you can dig through clay, it stays pretty much the way it is after you've dug it. So I think, for me, it's the physical properties of soil that are the most interesting things, and also of sediments, things in estuaries and, you know, at the bottom of the sea and things like that. These are various kinds of muds or clays or sands, and organisms mess with that all the time. And so the f interface between the engineer and the environment is this, how, how well can I work over the soil? And then once you understand that, you can also then say, okay, well, that's going to increase drainage or aeration, or whatever, and that will have these effects on plants, and so on and so forth. Yeah. 
Do you think that humans are engineering their planet for the best or for the worst? That's an excellent question. So, let's let me answer that by talking about um, give you two examples of animal engineers that are not humans. So, beaver build dams and make ponds, and we know that they gain a lot of advantages from that. Their lodge is protected in the middle of the pond from the climate. It's, it's in the winter, it's nice and warm and insulated. They, re they don't use as much energy to go and get food around the pond because they're very efficient at swimming, and it's more efficient than walking. If, uh, if an animal threatens them, they just dive into the water and are gone. So they get a lot of benefits. So now let's think about animals with hooves. It could be a cow, but it could be horse. it could be a horse, or it could be any of the animals in in Africa, right? The big animals, right? So they make hoof prints when they walk on soft ground, right? Those hoof prints can fill with water, and they create little miniature ponds. And there are all sorts of species that live in hoof prints, right? Do you think the cow cares about whether it made the hoof prints? Probably not. Okay. So there are a lot of situations in which you can change the environment, if you like, accidentally or incidentally, right? They have consequences. They have ecological consequences for other organisms, but not necessarily for the organism that engineered the environment. So I think humans have both of those things. So. We go out and we do something in the environment. If you build a house, right, it's going to benefit from you. It protects you from the weather, right? All right. If you uh, take off a, the top of a mountain, right, to get a coal, you're using the coal for energy, right? But all of the debris and all the streams that get filled in that make the water quality poor, right, that, that, that's not a deliberate, you're not trying to do that, it just happens as a consequence of removing the mountain. If you happen to depend on the water quality, that's a bad thing. It can come back to bite you. Right? So humans are, and, and a lot of species uh, are, are like that. They, there's this blend between uh, deliberate and accidental, and sometimes the accidental comes back and affects you. But the process of evolution by natural selection tends to mean that if you're going to modify the environment to your benefit, you better get it right. In other words, all the beaver that got dam building wrong are no longer with us. Thank you, everybody, Ray. Great. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much.